Hello and welcome from sunny Vienna in Austria for our conference, How Europe Can Contribute to Korean Unification, Lessons Learned from Dismantling the Iron Curtain. My name is Peter Haider. I serve as the president of the Universal Peace Federation here in Austria. When we look at Korea, and especially at the Korean War. Uh, it is now 70 years since it started, uh, 1950, and the war concluded not with really a peace treaty, but only with an armistice, leaving the once unified Korean peninsula divided, despite being populated by a people with a common history, culture, and language. The fate of the peninsula has been controlled not only by the people themselves, but by the wider geopolitical environment known for decades as the Cold War and today by the interest of the big powers surrounding it. Our founder, Dr. Sun Myung Moon, comes from Korea and he was born in what is now the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, more commonly known as North Korea. One of his dreams in his life was to see Korea united again. And uh, he visited under dramatic uh, and uh, very special circumstances North Korea in 1991 after he fled during the Korean War, at the end of the Korean War to the South, and there he also even could meet Kim Il-sung, which started a process of reconciliation. But by the time of his death in 2012, this process was not finished. So please understand that working for seeing his dreams fulfilled for us in this Universal Peace Federation, and also for his wife who took up his work and who is the co-founder of our organization. This is like a sacred duty to work for the unification of Korea. Korea is almost like a holy land, like the holy land in the Middle East. After 50 years of subjugation by Japan and now divided 70 years since the war, Korea deserves the firm support of the international community so that it can come together and be united again. In many ways, it was the international community which inflicted the pain of the unfortunate division on this innocent country during the final days of the Second World War in the Far East. With this in mind, the Universal Peace Federation organizes a variety of programs that bring together leading experts from a wide range of professional fields, government, academic, civil society, and even faith-based organizations, the media, business, arts, to explore the prospects for improving relations not only between the two Koreas, but among the other stakeholder countries of the region. Europeans experienced the division of the continent after the Second World War. The unification happened when many did not believe in it anymore and or put it into a far future. Europe carries a valuable experience of rapprochement of the divided continent, cutting down an iron curtain and growing together again within the European Union. And this process and experience might contain some helpful lessons for Korea. And this is why we organized this conference today to explore such possibilities. I want to uh, introduce now the moderator of our conference, Dr. Werner Faslamt. You will see when you look at, the, at our 
screen, uh, you see a button chat and a button question and answers. In the button chat, you can also see the long uh, CVs of the speakers and the moderator. Anyway, Dr. Faslamt, he is now the president of the Austrian Institute for European Security. He served uh, for 10 years as the defense minister of Austria. He was, I think, for over 20 years a member of the Austrian parliament. And for two years, he was also the third president of the Austrian parliament. And he is a really very active uh, personality in the field of dialogue when it comes uh, to all the critical areas of the world. He organizes every week a conference uh, with his own institute. Last week it was about Iran and uh, next week will be about Myanmar. So he is very versed in, in international relations. I'm very grateful uh, that he is with us today and he will then into, introduce our other speakers, which I also want to welcome uh, from the bottom of my heart, Honorable Magister Lukas Mandel from the, is a member of the European Parliament from Austria, and uh, Professor Brian Mias or Myers, I'm not sure how to pronounce it properly, he will surely tell us later, who is an American who is now teaching in Korea, so he will be very much able to tell us more about the Korean situation. And I want to hand over now to Dr. Faslam. Dr. Faslam, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for this kind presentation and uh, especially also for the kind invitation uh, to moderate this panel uh, on a hotspot, on a highly interesting theme for everybody all over the world. It's my great pleasure to be with you and I want to welcome uh, all ladies and gentlemen very heartily and of course especially our uh, speakers. I hope we will manage uh, to be complete because uh, one of the speakers still does have some technical problems uh, to get into our program, but we hope uh, he can manage very soon. He can manage very soon uh, to be in. And um, I want to start just in order to present you uh, the two speakers, who are, of course, quite different personalities coming from different countries, but still also do have uh, some things in common. What do I mean? What do I see? Uh, first of all, I want to present Lucas Mandel. Lucas Mandel uh, was born in 1979. He is 40 one years old uh, and he has already an interesting background because his mother was Dutch and his father was Austrian. Uh, already at school he was interested in international affairs and in politics. So he became the president of the Austrian Students Union already during his uh, period of studies. Afterwards uh, he studied at the University of Vienna and at the Economic University of Vienna, on the one hand communication and on the other hand also uh, economics. Then he became a member of uh, the regional parliament of Lower Austria already in 2008, where he served until 2017. And in 2017, he became the successor of Minister Kerstinger as member uh, of the European Parliament. In this Parliament, he has uh, quite an interesting career. He became member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. He became the Vice President of the Security and Defense Committee. And he is responsible, the responsible member of the European Parliament, on the one hand for Kosovo, and on the other hand for the Korean Peninsula. So he has uh, the chance also to give us a good overview, uh, not only from the Austrian side, but also from the Brussels side, uh, a look from uh, the European view. Okay, 
The second one is, uh, as it was already called, uh, Brian Reynolds Myers. Uh, he was born in New Jersey in America. Also quite interesting, his father uh, was American, his mother British. And he uh, had also a quite interesting ca career. Uh, he made his philosophy doctorate in North Korean studies in Germany. But he not only did work and study in Germany and lecture in Germany, but also in South Africa, uh, in other countries. He was in China, he was in Japan. And uh, his interest for Korea started very soon. Why? Because his father was a chaplain uh, with the American troops in South Korea. And so far he was confronted, not so much with the military side, but maybe with the consequences of the military side, also with the whole psychological field. And so I hope uh, that we will have uh, the opportunity uh, to see him pretty soon. It's also the first question that I uh, wanted more or less to ask him, because I think before we go, uh, directly into the matter, I would say maybe let's talk a little bit about uh, the situation because I think that maybe not everybody in Europe does have the right picture. We do have more or less a clear picture on South Korea. Uh, everybody knows the big brands and the big uh, companies like Hyundai and Samsung, uh, for everybody is aware that this is a very strong economic country uh, with a very high uh, technological level. On the other side, if I look at the pictures uh, that are known from North Korea, I'm not so sure whether people do have the right picture. Uh, everybody you can see in European media is, well, when there is a talk about uh, North Korea, Troop parrots, I would say, much, much military, uh, the person of the King, uh, of the Kim family, uh, and maybe sometime the report of, I don't know, hunger or famine. The question whether this is still true or not, I want to pose also uh, to Lucas Mandel. Maybe you can give us a little bit your impression. Uh, how is this situation? Because if you want to, uh, unify something, you also have to be aware uh, how is the situation in the two parts, what is the difference uh, economically, politically, socially. Please, Lucas, if you'd be so nice and go on, take uh, the floor. Thank you for having me. Thank you for organizing this uh, very important talk today. Uh, thanks uh, for uh, sharing this today talk to distinguished President Werner Fassland and special thanks to uh, the Universal Peace Federation and Peter Haider especially for uh, initiating this conference. I really look forward to the contribution by Mr. Myers. I'm sure I can learn a lot from today's discussion. And uh, since uh, Werner Fassland has asked me, I tried to contribute uh, a bit from my perspective, chairing the delegation of the European Parliament with the Korean Peninsula. Uh, there are some specifications uh, which uh, are important and which are different with this delegation with the Korean Peninsula compared to other delegations of the European Parliament. Uh, one point is that uh, in the case of North Korea, the European Parliament is the only EU institution with formal official contacts with North Korea. Uh, the European Commission and the uh, European Council do not have these uh, formal contacts. Uh, this is only uh, something the European Parliament does uh, in order to remain in contact, uh, which uh, always seems better to me than to uh, skip contacts. Uh, actually, uh, preparing for this very conference today, uh, I uh, asked uh, a think tank uh, person, think tank leader from the United States of America, uh, who is dealing a lot with the Korean Peninsula, very specifically on the question of uh, reunification, uh, because uh, dealing with daily business regarding the Korean Peninsula 
my first thought, frankly, uh, was maybe not that uh, visionary as it should be, as it actually must be, because preparing for today, my first thought was, okay, is there a real chance? Is there a real opportunity? Do we talk uh, about something concrete uh, that can be achieved, or would it be naive to talk about uh, reunification? But what I have learned in this discussion with this think tank person from America, uh, as well as in the further preparation for today uh, is especially uh, the comparison with what we have experienced in Europe uh, between uh, East and West Germany. Uh, in the past, of course, there are differences uh, in the situation given today between South Korea and North Korea, but it can be compared. And of course, also in the case of East and West Germany, uh, many people uh, on this planet, maybe the majority of decision takers, uh, did not expect a reunification, at least not so fast as it really happened then. Uh, but we have to focus on uh, daily politics as well. We have to focus on uh, possible outcomes that really can be affected. Uh, and we have to focus on the differences to the situation that time uh, in the that time to Germany's uh, compared to today's uh, situation on the Korean Peninsula. But we have to remain visionary. Uh, and I want to share with you, uh, the, it's a matter of fact that it's part of the constitution of South Korea that uh, reunification remains a perspective and it remains a goal. Uh, and uh, this is also a visionary approach of a constitution which I highly appreciate. Uh, and uh, on the other side, uh, one can really claim after more than 1,000 years uh, that uh, the people on uh, the Korean Peninsula in these two countries of today always have been one people and always have been together. Uh, they were together at least until 70 years ago uh, when they were separated. So there is some kind of destiny, I would say, uh, historic destiny of uh, Korean people belonging together, no matter whether uh, they live in the South or in the North. So there are many good reasons to remain with this vision in daily politics, but also to, to uh, take care of daily politics and daily questions. And then it comes uh, also regarding uh, possible reunification to very concrete questions regarding economy, regarding average income, uh, which is uh, much more different than it was in East uh, Germany and West Germany. Then it comes to healthcare system questions, uh, which is, of course, uh, very, very different in North Korea than in uh, South Korea. Uh, it also comes to very practical questions for many regular people, for example, uh, employees of the army of North Korea, which may would expect uh, to lose their jobs if uh, North Korea would not uh, uh, have such a large army as it has today for reasons uh, which we don't agree on, frankly. So there will be a lot to discuss, even if there would be uh, not uh, a formal uh, situation of war. And officially, South Korea and North Korea uh, are still at war. This is also a difference to East and West Germany at that time. So normalization uh, after this period of war, formerly war today, uh, a normalization after this period would be a precondition for any uh, talk about reunification. So we can see uh, that the one is a democratic state uh, with liberal democracy based on rule of law, as we in the Western world always appreciate it and uh, try to achieve for each and every human being. And the other is an autocratic state, a dictatorship, actually. Uh, this uh, this uh, this is uh, something the situation on the Korean Peninsula has in common with the that time situation in Germany, but there is uh, a lot that which is also different to the that time situation in Germany, and we have to focus on that as well. By the way, before I conclude this uh, contribution from my side, I want to share something very positive from South Korea from last night. The colleagues in the Parliament of South Korea have decided last night on the labor standards uh, provided by the International Labor Organization, ILO, and they have agreed in the majority voting in the Korean parliament to ratify the ILO standards, which is uh, a huge step forward in our anyway absolutely great 
economic relationship with South Korea, uh, which is not only an economic relationship, but also uh, with regard to the field of security and politics. So South Korea is, of course, a strong partner, a reliable partner for the European Union. Uh, and this is one example of last night, uh, uh, among many other examples. Uh, and then, and, uh, uh, and is connected with the overall situation. And this overall situation also shows us that North Korea is, uh, besides other things, a security threat and, of course, not a partner country in any regard. So uh, this is, uh, I would say, the precondition for any consideration or re reflection on, on uh, reunification. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, this first statement. And uh, if I go back, what you said, you know, you stressed uh, the common destiny, and this is very true. I mean, it's amazing if you look to the peninsula, you know, situated between China uh, on the one hand and Japan at the other side of the sea, it could develop, it could develop not only its own uh, culture and civilization, but really, uh, extremely high standards and for hundreds of years also served as a transmitter from Chinese developments to Japan and on the other hand also from Japan uh, to China and insofar it certainly had uh, the function of an more or less an ankle between China uh, and Japan. Uh, they developed their own scripture, uh, their own uh, letters, their own literature and so on. Yeah, uh, if we look to this uh, specific situation, on the other hand, you also mentioned already that there are, of course, also differences uh, between the systems. This doesn't make it easier. But as you said it, with the most famous case of uh, a divided country, this certainly used to be Germany. We also have the examples of uh, Vietnam, we have the example of Yemen, uh, where, still, where we still can find fighting at the moment, uh, and in some other respect, maybe also Austria. Uh, but if I go back, you know, and I want to uh, just maybe go back to this highly interesting situation of reunification between Western and Eastern Germany. You were a young person, but already interested I mean, uh, what was the way uh, you followed uh, then these developments? What was your impression? What can you see now also uh, as the outcome of this development uh, in the middle of Europe at the end of the Cold War in Europe? Uh, if you're addressing me again, uh, yes, Jana Faslam, thank you. Um, uh, you uh, suggest that I was... Uh, young if you would ask my children uh, they would not agree with uh, that but i know what you mean i was 11 years old when the iron curtain fell i watched on tv uh, the different stages of this development and uh, the outcomes of this reunification are of major importance i have to call it a blessing for europe uh, what happened uh, in germany was a blessing for the Germans, of course, in the first place, but secondly, and had an enormous impact for Europe. Uh, it meant that uh, actually Europe can breathe again with both lungs, as uh, the Pope that time, uh, uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, claimed. And he's quoted with that. Uh, uh, Europe was uh, reunified. Uh, uh, after Germany was reunified. And today we have uh, some trouble in daily politics, of course. We have to solve it democratically, parliamentarily, in proper ways. But uh, it was a major achievement for Europe. And that means for the world, for the contribution of Europe to the rest of the world, for the wealth of the Europeans, uh, for the internal market, which uh, provided the Europeans with a lot of extra wealth, opportunities, jobs, exchange of people, uh, which seems to be a crucial point actually also on the Korean Peninsula and between especially North Korea and the rest of the world, exchange of people in many different 
fields, academia, but also sports and culture and so on. So uh, if we can convey any message from Europe to the rest of the world uh, about our assessment of uh, the reunification of uh, West and East Germany, and actually the reunification of Europe as a whole, so to speak, then this message is absolutely and clearly a positive one uh, with regard to economy, but also with regard to values and with regard to future opportunities for generations to come. Yeah, uh, I think the message you are giving us, you know, this, that this unification was not only important for Germany, but it was important for the whole of Europe, for the whole continent. Maybe also should be a message we can give to the Korean people. It's not only a question between North and South. It is also a question, at least for the whole of Eastern Asia, because the whole region will be touched and will be influenced by such a development. Uh, and if we look back to this uh, process of unification, it is quite interesting, you know. I started a little bit earlier than you. Uh, I remember when I was around about in the age of, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 years old, uh, I remember posters in Austria that said, Hände weg von Korea, hands off, hands away from Korea. This came mainly from the communist side then and meant uh, the Western world should keep out. And this brings us maybe a little bit back, you know, why is the country divided? It's not divided because the people did not want to live together, but it was divided due to the fact that Korea at the beginning or since the beginning of the 20th century was occupied by Japanese troops, uh, more or less belonged to the Japanese empire. And at the end of the Second World War, it was freed. It was freed from the northern side by the Russians and from the southern side by the Americans. And they met at the 38th latitude, geographically uh, more or less in the middle. And insofar, uh, this separation of uh, freeing the country by two different powers also more or less brought the split into the country. So it was not a self-imposed uh, separation, but it was more or less imposed from outside. It brought the different systems. It brought the different uh, developments. And insofar, you can say separation is not a Korean solution, for sure not. And if we go back to what you said uh, about this process in Germany, you know, it was quite interesting for me also uh, as a young guy then to follow the, the discussions in Germany. Uh, you had two different positions, whether Western Germany should cooperate with uh, Eastern Germany, yes or no. Uh, some were hesitant and others said, okay, it will be necessary. And you can say it was Willy Brandt, a social democrat politician and statesman who more or less opened the dialogue with his Eastern initiative, for sure. And it lasted still 20 years until the wall in Berlin, until the Iron Curtain uh, they uh, could bring away. So far, it was not just a question of a few uh, days. It was interesting that at the first meeting, you know, uh, when Willy Brandt came to Berlin, uh, people uh, would be on the streets and they would call Willy. And the funny thing was that Willy meant uh, was the pre-name, was the first name uh, of the prime minister of uh, Eastern Germany and on the other hand also from Brandt. And insofar they could do it, uh, although they were not allowed to praise or to call, uh, to welcome uh, the Western German uh, chancellor. And the same you could see afterwards, you know, when uh, in the during the unification process when Helmut Kohl uh, went for the first time uh, to Eastern Berlin and so on. Helmut, Helmut, Helmut. And at the same time, the people also shouted, wir sind das Volk. We are the people. That's what they shouted. Uh, and this strong movement, you know, on the one hand, outstanding personalities, 
Brandt coal. Uh, they managed big parts of the process. And on the other hand, also the will of the people. This was very significant for me. Uh, you, you even could feel it emotionally, you know, this will of the people uh, sticking, coming together, finding together. We are one nation. That's what you said from the beginning. And I think this is quite interesting. So coming back, it was difficult in Germany. Uh, on the one hand, Eastern part being part of the Soviet empire. Soviet soldiers, only a few hundred kilometers uh, in distance from Bonn or from Brussels or from, uh, from Hague or from Paris and so on. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, of course, you know, you had this very strong integration of Western Germany into the Western system. And a similar situation we, we do have now, that we have a confrontation. And it's not only the two parts, but of course also the strategic situation that you have uh, American influence at the, the uh, Korean Peninsula on the one hand, and on the other hand, of course, also for China, very important factor uh, that you have a communist system as a neighbor and not uh, a democratic system as it is in the, uh, in the southern part. Insofar, we have to be aware, uh, the situation will be dependent, of course, on, uh, on the two brother countries, but also uh, it will be influenced heavily by the situation uh, of America and China and maybe even Japan. How do you see this constellation at the moment? Are you still addressing me, Werner? Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Myers could not join us yet so far. It will be more see. dialogue between us. I see. No, I'm Sorry here, actually. That. I'm here, actually. I, I don't oh. know if you can hear. Yeah, I'm here. I made it. Ah, super. So, yeah, okay. just then so you know. But please, I go take, ahead. take it back and please, if you start immediately, you know, no, you know, I'll much just start more with my career than, presentation. than all of us. Okay, please start with Okay. You. Yeah, well, uh, let me start by saying, um, well, thank you, of course, to Mr. Heider and the UPF for having me. And uh, thank you, Dr. Fasselaven, for the introduction. and. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mandel, for the very interesting presentation. This is something that's always interested me because, uh, as you know, uh, I, I researched Korea, but I also lived in divided Germany and I visited East Germany very often. Uh, what I warn against is the notion that a divided Korea is still straggling down a road traveled over 30 years ago in Europe, uh, which can therefore help the two Koreas by sharing the secret of its success. I think Europe would be able to give more constructive support if it were better aware of how different things are here, especially in regard to ideology, because the front line on the peninsula is, is really not drawn between liberal democracy and authoritarian socialism, but between moderate and radical nationalism. Now, it is certainly a representative democracy here, but the ruling party does not like the term liberal democracy very much. In Korean, Chayu Minjujui, uh, that term here on the peninsula has a right wing uh, ring to it, a right-wing sound to it. And in fact, the ruling party has been trying to revise the constitution to the effect that uh, the word liberal will be taken out. Um, so I would say it's a representative democracy with a moderate nationalist outlook. And that makes for a very different um, situation from what we had in divided Germany. Now, unfortunately, the ideological reality tends to be kept from Western view by the South Koreans, who naturally prefer to show a more uh, liberal democratic face uh, to the American ally. And one result of this is that Koreans discuss unification very differently among themselves from the way in which they discuss it in English with foreigners. Now, it, the main model for unification here turns up repeatedly in the ruling camp's Korean language communication, but it's a taboo topic in South Korea's English language press. So the outside world is still largely unaware of it. Now that model is uh, Korean Confederation. Uh, in 1960, Kim Il-sung uh, first proposed 
uh, a Korean confederation to South Korea, but he did it with such unfriendly rhetoric uh, that the idea didn't really catch on here in the South. Support for it uh, increased on the South Korean left in the 1970s and 1980s, but ironically enough, it was the right-wing ruling party that called loud loudest for it in the late 1980s, uh, around the time of the Seoul Olympics in 1988. But this time, the North Koreans weren't interested. Why? Because they were now in the weaker position economically, and they rightly feared that the South Koreans just wanted to take over the North. So it wasn't until 2000, uh, the June 15th, 2000 summit, that the leaders of both Koreas reached an agreement on this issue. Uh, in the summit declaration, they pledged to work toward confederation by finding common ground between the North and South Korean models. Uh, the outside world didn't pay very much attention to that part of the declaration, but that pledge has played a very large role for the past uh, 21 years in the discourse of the people who are now in power here. So Moon Jae-in, when he was running for president in 2012, pledged to confederate the peninsula during his five-year term. That's a very ambitious goal. Now, of course, he lost that election, but he won in 2017, and virtually everything he's done or tried to do on the inter-Korean front since then, uh, like the dismantling of guard posts along the DMZ, uh, the groundbreaking for an inter-Korean railroad, uh, the recent law against leaflet balloons, all of these things can be interpreted as steps or attempted steps uh, in the construction of a confederation. And when the uh, inter-Korean liaison of office opened in September 2018, it was expressis verbis described in uh, pro-government newspaper headlines as the first step in the confederation process. Now, why was that liaison office demolished last year with explosives? Well, let's remember that what has protected North Korea since well before it had nuclear weapons has been the Americans' fear that any strike on North Korea will result in a devastating artillery retaliation against Seoul. Uh, so that is really what's been protecting North Korea all this time is that fear um, on the Americans' part. Therefore, any outward progress in inter-Korean relations poses a certain danger to the North's security because it undermines the plausibility of its threat to destroy Seoul if attacked. In other words, if North and South Korea look too cozy with each other, the Americans will think North Korea is not going to attack Seoul if we strike North Korea. You see what I mean? So for this reason, inter-Korean relations must never be allowed to get too far or too visibly ahead of relations between Washington and Pyongyang. Now, they did get further ahead in 2018, certainly, in a, a, a joint Korean effort to create enough momentum to bowl over Donald Trump. Uh, and this risky strategy almost worked. Uh, we know from John Bolton, who was in the White House at the time, uh, that Trump was completely caught up in the euphoria that followed the Panmunjom summit. But then came the Hanoi setback almost exactly two years ago today in 2019, and relations between the US and North Korea went into a freeze again. So the liaison office in Kaesong, which was designed as the start of the confederation process, came to be seen in the North as dangerously premature. And uh, it was demolished last year amid some theatrical uh, condemnation of South Korea. But behind the scenes, the inter-Korean relationship is much warmer than it was uh, before Moon Jae-in took over. The sanctions give no room for economic cooperation so the South Korean government has focused on laying the domestic foundation for confederation instead. And government representatives are still traveling around the country despite the pandemic, uh, promoting confederation to educators, administrators, and influencers. Now, there are euphemisms for this, like peace system, uh, new peninsula system, but they mean confederation. And we know this because the avowed model here for the peace system, uh, is, as the Vice Minister of Unification said on Tuesday, the European Union, okay? They talk about an economic community, but they don't say NAFTA, they don't say Mercosur, uh, which would be only an economic community or only a trade bloc. They always say the EU, which uh, as you know, and as you know, uh, Mr. Mundell, I'm sure knows much better than anybody, is a confederal system with federal elements. 
uh, and this part of the discussion, I believe, is where the European community and the peace studies community can and should step in. Is the European Union really a feasible model for a partnership between a democracy and a dictatorship? Is it realistic to hope that the two parties remain equal? Is it realistic to hope that they will not begin intervening in each other's political systems? What are the benefits and dangers? I think it's high time these matters were openly discussed. Now, the two Koreas want to keep this issue to themselves until such a time as they can spring it on the rest of the world as a fait accompli. But that doesn't mean we foreigners have to uh, censor ourselves. Uh, I think uh, it would be better for all parties uh, and for the cause of peace if this issue were uh, forced out into the sunlight and uh, exposed to critical uh, international discussion. Uh, so maybe I should stop uh, right there and uh, we can take up the discussion from that point, if you like. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, yeah, this jumping in. And I think it was highly interesting uh, because as you said, usually this is not, uh, you will not find it in the Western media. Uh, right only in some special reports, just as I also tried to mention at the beginning, you know, uh, the Western picture about North Korea certainly is a little bit uh, out of reality, I would say, uh, somehow. Uh, I mean, if you look to the situation, it's not, it's not hunger that is dominating this situation, but uh, due to uh, it's very, difficult situation by sanctions and so on, and isolation, also self-isolation, somehow they developed quite a remarkable uh, uh, economy. I mean, also if you look to the system uh, and therefore uh, the big question is, can one really uh, count on uh, such a model, you know, uh, a federation with different, not only backgrounds, but different systems. Because uh, you have to say on the one hand, uh, it's not only a communist versus a capitalist, uh, 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 centralized versus uh, a market system uh, from the economy, but you also have more or less uh, the rule of a dynasty in the North, and you have a more or less democratic system, or let us say, uh, moderate democratic system uh, in, in the South, yeah. And insofar, I just want uh, to put this question now uh, also to Lucas. How do you see the situation from uh, the view of the European Parliament? And then maybe uh, just answer uh, freely because we try to be very frank, very open, very flexible also in our discussion. Please, Lucas, if you go ahead and uh, tell us a view also, and if you respond a little bit uh, to what Mr. Myers uh, told us immediately before. Absolutely, I thank Mr. Myers for being so frank, uh, and that's uh, what we uh, should do in today's discussion. And generally, uh, actually, I've learned a lot from uh, the contribution of Mr. Myers, and uh, I want to focus, as you have mentioned, Werner Fassland, uh, uh, right now on the EU's role and especially the European Parliament's role. As mentioned, the European Parliament is the only uh, body uh, of the European Union with uh, official formal contact with North Korea as well. And uh, there is only one part of the world with uh, that many uh, different agreements with uh, the European Union, uh, and this is South Korea. Uh, South Korea has an agreement with the European Union in the field of politics, in the field of security, uh, which is of major importance uh, as well, and in the field of economy. Uh, and uh, maybe the contribution from EU side for a possible uh, reunification, and one of the lessons of, of what Mr. Myers has said for me is his deep insight that maybe people uh, in uh, Korea or on the Korean Peninsula talk to each other more about opportunities for unification or what it would mean than uh, we would expect from outside uh, or as English media uh, or English language media tells us from the Korean Peninsula. This is a, a major, a major lesson for me from what Mr. Myers has said. So let's uh, keep on running and let's see what European Union can do in that field. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, with regard to economy, 
uh, because uh, due to this agreement I have mentioned with South Korea, uh, which uh, has been established 11 years ago now, the exchange of goods and services between the EU and South Korea has risen by two thirds. So this means a lot of uh, development, wealth, jobs, uh, and uh, growth in EU as well as in South Korea. It's a huge success story with uh, South Korea, which, uh, uh, which is uh, also based on uh, democracy and rule of law. I have to underline that the partner country of EU we're sharing uh, similar values, sharing the values of the so-called political West, which is, as we can see here, in many cases also established in the geographical East, of course. So um, I would say the field of economy shows that EU as an honest broker and as a reliable partner where rule of law is in place, a rule of law is a big, I would say, promise of European Union to the inside as well as to the outside, to the rest of the world. Each and everybody on this planet can expect that rule of law is in place in the European Union. We work on that. Uh, I had uh, different negotiations uh, even today on that. Uh, rule of law is a, a core part of what European Union is about and each and everybody can expect it uh, in the European Union and in the field of economy, I guess EU can be a strong partner of the Korean Peninsula as a whole if a reunification one day will be in place. Today, EU is of course a huge uh, development aid partner of North Korea, uh, among other things, uh, dealing with North Korea among sanctions uh, as well, uh, not only the UN sanctions, but also especially established EU sanctions regarding North Korea. Uh, also, development uh, aid is a core part of the so-called critical engagement, uh, which is the general title of uh, EU's uh, policy approach regarding North Korea. So economy would be a major part and, of course, the role of a good facilitator, of an honest broker, I guess, uh, compared with any other part of the world. I would claim that for us as European Union, uh, if uh, different partners, different sites, actors in the region on the Korean Peninsula want us, we would be ready to be uh, facilitating, to uh, be in the role of an honest broker. Uh, and uh, especially from my perspective of, I would call it uh, parliamentary diplomacy from the European Parliament, uh, I guess uh, to talk to each other, to remain in contact, to seek opportunities and solutions via talking to each other without any kind of violence and uh, uh, things alike uh, would be the approach the EU and especially the European Parliament uh, can establish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And maybe uh, I go further on and want to ask Mr. Myers, uh, where do you see the chances, but also the obstacles? I mean, even if there, if there will, yeah. Uh, is it realistic, you know, uh, if you look to the situation, and the, is it also uh, easy or possible to go away besides the big powers? Uh, we have heard already, uh, I mean, strong interest of big powers in the region, of course, uh, to, uh, to the situation that competition between China and America uh, is not decreasing, but increasing probably for the coming years. Uh, this probably will not make it easier. And if you look also to, I don't know, the economic side, you have to say, okay, uh, around about 40% of, uh, of North Korean imports are coming from China. But China is not the big market for North Korea. It's rather South Korea and Japan where uh, North Korea is exporting its products. Uh, and insofar, the situation is not so easy. So my question to Mr. Myers is, uh, where do you see the chances? Where do you see the obstacles uh, for unification, for reunification okay. between the two partners? And maybe also if you look uh, a little bit at this positioning between uh, the two giants. Okay. Well. Uh, as I see it, the main problem uh, facing the two Koreas is that they have a very different understanding of confederation. Uh, the North Koreans have always envisioned a much tighter form 
a partnership than the South Koreans have. Kim Il-sung wanted one federal state with the North and South each maintaining their own systems inside that state. On the other hand, the South Koreans have tended to recommend a much looser arrangement uh, that would not entail forming a single state until unification. But more important really are the differences in the envisioned time frame. South Koreans believe confederation would be in itself a kind of de facto uh, unification, which should be sustained for at least 20 years, while the North's standard of living gradually rises to the South's level. Uh, but that's not a realistic option for North Korea. The personality cult cannot survive for long if Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in become equal, uh, mutually respectful partners uh, who are managing a divided peninsula. Kim, Kim Jong-un is nothing without the claim to being the sole legitimate ruler of the Korean nation. So for him, confederation can only be a transition phase that must be entered into as discreetly as possible I think the North Koreans would prefer a secret confederation, and it must be got through as quickly as possible in order to reach full uh, unification under Kim dynasty rule. So in this fundamental difference of opinion, I see uh, great potential for uh, trouble down the road. And um, the American presence is, I think, also problematic. The South Korean government wants a small American troop presence to remain here, but at the same time to refrain from conducting military exercises, which upset North Korea, and not to have the THAAD anti-missile system, uh, which upsets China. Uh, all the Moon government really wants, I think, is for the American troops to reassure foreign investors and the South Korean mainstream. But for one thing, the Americans cannot be interested uh, in, in remaining here under those circumstances. Uh, US troops are here to protect North Korea from South Korea. And if those two countries are partners in a, in a European Union type confederation, that mission becomes absurd, but it also becomes very dangerous. And this is what I think is the danger. The danger is that the South Koreans at some point change their minds about confederation, uh, just as the British changed their minds about the EU. And they would then look to the US ally to help get them out of this confederation. And that would be a very dangerous situation indeed. We saw two North Korean attacks on South Korea after the South Koreans uh, uh, pulled out of the sunshine policy under a conservative administration. So that could get very uh, messy indeed. And this is why I believe that the US needs to closely monitor this situation and to make very clear to the South Korean people that they really have to choose between confederation and the military alliance with the United States. They really can't feasibly have both. Uh, and therefore, the South Koreans need to think very carefully before entering into a partnership with uh, a nuclearized dictatorship. That's one problem that I see. Um, I think we also need to take human rights into consideration. Let's remember the inter-German process, which got underway during Ostpolitik, and which is often remembered as antagonistic cooperation, uh, is now recognized by German historians as having induced an increase in surveillance and oppression in East Germany. The state had to tighten control over daily life uh, in order to prevent West Germany from subverting it. And it's no secret anymore that Ostpolitik helped not only East Germany's finances with a big credit that Franz Josef Strauss uh, gave to the East Germans, but also its stature on the world stage. You know, 1987 was the high point for Honecker and the GDR. You know, Honecker was uh, very well received in Bonn, um, although, of course, both were brought down by Gorbachev shortly thereafter. So when Germans or Austrians or Europeans in general uh, tell the Koreans, you must take small steps like we did and unification will be the organic result, I think it's very misleading, you know, especially because the ideological landscape is so different here. Why did the two Germanys agree on so many humanitarian steps even before Ostpolitik started? How was it that at the height of the Cold War uh, in the early to mid 1960s, there were already inter-German letters and family visits and telephone contacts and all those things that the two Koreas still lack? Uh, the shallow answer is that the Koreans had a war and the Germans didn't, but the more important reason is that in divided Germany, you had a competition of two ideologies 
which were each claiming to be more humanist and humane than the other. And each Germany was the showcase of its ideology, so neither side could afford to look too callous on the international stage. Uh, and, and, and so you had a kind of humanitarian competition between East and West Germany, even though, of course, their ideas of human rights were very different. Here on the peninsula, the dominant ideology has always been nationalism. So the two sides criticized each other, not on humanitarian grounds, but on nationalist grounds, saying uh, the North Koreans are lackeys of the Soviet Union. The South Koreans are lackeys of the United States. And this propaganda war, unfortunately, did not conduce to uh, the kind of humanitarian uh, improvements that you saw uh, in divided Germany even before Ostpolitik. Uh, and now that the North Korean view of modern history is gaining ground in South Korea, uh, it seems likely to me that reducing the gap between the two Koreas, the political and cultural gap, uh, may be more a matter of the South limiting human rights here than of the North expanding them up there. And I think the leaflet law is a good example of that. And uh, I, I do worry that that process might end in North Korea getting the upper hand despite its economic uh, inferiority. And this is another area in which I would wish that uh, the European Union or the Europeans, uh, having experienced at least a similar situation, uh, would make their opinions better known to uh, the South Korean ruling government, the ruling party here. Yeah, uh, you uh, show us very clearly, you know, where uh, there are obstacles and, and differences and difficulties. And insofar, the question is, what do you think uh, a federation, a confederation could bring? Maybe if, you, if we go into such a model. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, what many people on the South Korean, um, uh, in the South Korean ruling camp believe is that at the very least, confederation would be able to make North Korea relax. The South Koreans believe rightly or wrongly that the moment North Korea enters a confederation with South Korea, the United States will no longer be able to attack uh, North Korea. As I say, I'm not sure whether that's a correct assumption, but it is the assumption that the ruling camp is making here. And they believe that once North Korea relaxes as a result of the security guarantee which is brought to it by confederation, it will embark on the denuclearization process. I need to make very clear here, the South Koreans do not believe that confederation should be the reward for denuclearization. They believe it should uh, take place before denuclearization in order to make it more likely. Uh, I'm not really uh, sure whether that's uh, whether that could work as well as they believe it will. Um, I don't, um, I certainly am very skeptical about the expectation that inter-Korean trade and exchange will further the cause of peace. You know, uh, Nazi Germany and the USSR were big trading partners right up until uh, Operation Barbarossa, just as Iran and Israel are today. So the evidence doesn't necessarily corroborate the neoliberal belief that uh, commerce makes friends out of enemies. There was inter-Korean trade here during the Korean War uh, and in the late 1950s. And more recently, the Kaesong Industrial Zone did not bring uh, the two Koreas closer together. It was in fact a routine source of conflict and tension in its own right. And it wasn't sanctions that shut down the Kumgang San Tourist Resort uh, in 2008. It was the brutal killing of a South Korean housewife by the North Korean military. Um, so the idea that inter-Korean trade and cooperation uh, you know, need to get underway in a confederation and then uh, the trust building efforts, uh, effects are, are bound to ensue, that's an idea that I'm a little bit uh, skeptical about. So I really can't tell you, or perhaps I'm not the right person to ask about the benefits of uh, confederation because I see primarily dangers. I think this is a, a, a route to peace which is fraught with, um, fraught with dangers and with possibilities for making the situation worse. Okay, yeah. Uh, Lucas, how do, do you see this situation and uh, also 
the obstacles, uh, even if you think and compare it maybe uh, with the former situation uh, in Europe, in Germany, or maybe even in Austria. Please go ahead. Uh, actually, I have uh, not yet uh, talked uh, uh, deeper on denuclearization, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, maybe the first uh, goal, the priority of European Union approach uh, mm -hmm. in the field of critical engagement towards North Korea. Mr. Myers has now mentioned denuclearization, and I find it very interesting. It's another takeaway for me from today's discussion that maybe from at least some North, uh, it, excuse me, at least uh, from some South Korean approach, uh, denuclearization could be something uh, that becomes more likely due to a uh, before happening reunification or uh, whatever kind of uh, more cooperation. Uh, maybe, maybe this could be a leverage uh, which not uh, everybody on the planet would agree on, but it's an interesting thought uh, we could at least theoretically discuss. Uh, one other thing is uh, the idea that uh, uh, I would, I, I would uh, even while I appreciate everything uh, Mr. Myers has said, and I learned a lot, as I have already stated, uh, I would uh, still uh, argue for the idea that uh, economy makes friends. <clears throat> and uh, just imagine, uh, that's at least my view, uh, how that the situation could be worse if there would be absolutely no exchange of anything between regular people in daily life. So um, economy is maybe not the only solution, but economy is usually um, a part of the solution and usually not a part of the problem. Uh, maybe we could uh, at least agree on that. Uh, and um, I totally agree with Mr. Myers claiming that it's not the European example to uh, claim that organic uh, development via small steps would lead to reunification. This is not what happened in Europe, frankly, uh, and this is usually not what uh, maybe history tells us about true uh, unification processes. So maybe we should share our opinions. If I understood Mr. Myers right, I agree with uh, sharing opinions uh, on also, uh, let's say, society uh, and uh, and how a state works with both the countries from European side would be maybe worthy, uh, but also to listen, of course, uh, all the time. And uh, frankly, there is a huge difference. We have not yet pointed out that much today between the that time situation in Europe and Germany and today's Korean Peninsula. And that's uh, that actually East Germany collapsed. So it was not a unification of two uh, states on the same level or something alike. It was the case that uh, East Germany collapsed and uh, the people of East Germany, as Werner Fasslabend has quoted and pointed out very emotionally, and I like that, I, I like to remember that it's a lot of meaning in that for Europe when the people uh, in East Germany shouted, we are the people uh, and uh, made clear uh, uh, let's say, uh, how they identify themselves. And uh, these are all, uh, these are all uh, aspects of collapsing uh, East Germany at that time, which is not the case, uh, not today and maybe not tomorrow and uh, not on a short term or at least midterm perspective with North Korea, I would predict. So there are uh, many, many um, differences. Uh, anyway, the vision remains, uh, and there are some positive aspects about the vision we have talked about today, especially the regular people in uh, both Koreas who are obviously talking to each other, uh, as already mentioned. But I agree with Mr. Myers that the route to peace uh, is one with a lot of dangers. That's what he said uh, uh, in, in the end of his last statement, and maybe that's something we have to... Uh, keep in mind. Uh, it will not be easy, but uh, we should not, let's say, lose the, this target out of sight because it remains a target. And we have, we have not yet claimed it that way. It's what the people of the Korean Peninsula deserve. <laughs> they deserve to be in one country, not in divided countries, and of course not uh, under 
uh, the regime of a dictatorship uh, in the case of North Korea. So maybe this should be our first thought always. What, what would the people deserve there and what uh, would be our wish for future generations of, of uh, the inhabitants of the Korean Peninsula? Yeah, maybe also a few words, you know, to uh, the question of denuclearization. Of course, uh, this is or would be a major issue. Why? Because on the one hand, uh, due to the geographic situation of Korea between China and Japan, uh, this would make quite a difference. Uh, you know that uh, Japan has renounced to produce uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear armament, although technologically uh, they easily could do it more or less uh, within a few months. Uh, due to uh, this goal of uh, contribution to a peaceful world and uh, not further distribution of uh, nuclear cap capability. And a unified uh, Korea certainly uh, would bring the next step, nu the nuclearization of Japan. And th this is something that certainly not the Chinese do want to have, and also not the Americans do want to have. Uh, and maybe also the rest of the world is not so, uh, would not be so fond about it. And insofar, this question certainly is a big uh, question in every uh, re reunification process. Yeah, I just want to go back maybe uh, before we ask uh, other uh, participants to ask the one or the other question. Uh, yeah, if you, if you look to this situation, this will to be unified, to this immense capability that uh, the national question has, because you have extremely uh, high, uh, extremely many people uh, in the South and in the North who are working very hard, who are uh, very capable and so on. And insofar uh, to unify it, of course, would bring out a, not only a big nation of almost 80 million people, uh, what you could compare with Germany, for example, in, in uh, Europe, uh, and uh, this certainly would change the strategic situation in the Eastern Asian region. So now maybe uh, I want to ask whether there came in already some questions from our participants. I have some questions, especially to uh, Mr. Myers. What is your position on the effect of sanctions towards North Korea? Did the system of East Germany collapse economically rather than due to the so-called Entspannungspolitik? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I don't believe that uh, economic pressures had much of a role in uh, East Germany's collapse. Um, I, I, I think that sanctions, um, from an American perspective, of course, I'm, you know, I'm, I, you know, a citizen of the country that is threatened by North Korean nuclear weapons more than the South Koreans are, of course. The nuclear weapons are not a particularly big issue to the South Koreans because uh, their country is already too exposed uh, to uh, the threat from conventional weapons from North Korea. Uh, I am a supporter of sanctions, uh, but I do believe uh, that they should be loosened if the North Koreans make uh, significant concessions. Uh, I don't think it's realistic to hope uh, for the North Koreans to, uh, you know, to achieve full disarmament before the Americans can loosen sanctions. And I don't think that's the Americans' position either. Um, I must say I'm surprised by how strict the Americans are being about um, sanctions at the moment, because as you know, under uh, Barack Obama and George W. Bush, uh, the Koreas enjoyed a kind of ethnic exemption from sanctions. The Kesong Industrial Zone was allowed to keep going, uh, and the um, Kumgangsan Forest Resort uh, were allowed to stay open. And now uh, the Americans are keeping a very close eye uh, and and reviewing even uh, you know proposed uh, humanitarian cooperation. 
I'm not sure whether that's um, so helpful or not. I think, uh, well, we'll see. The Biden administration, uh, I think, is going to uh, make a small deal with the North Koreans at some point. Uh, this is what we learned from uh, John Bolton's book about uh, the White House. The State Department is very eager for an action for action deal. And of course, Biden is placing great emphasis on human rights, but I don't think that's incompatible with a loosening of sanctions. And I think this is something the Americans are going to end up uh, conceding to the North Koreans. Yeah, and how do you see uh, China's position? China, um, I, I don't really feel qualified to talk about China. I don't really know that situation very much, but I will say that um, the South Korean ruling party here is very pro-Chinese. This is another uh, aspect which often gets lost uh, by the English language press. Uh, but uh, the, the, the ruling party, these are people who for years have been saying that it's time for uh, South Korea to shift out of the American camp into uh, the Chinese camp. Ideally, of course, uh, the South Koreans would like to be able to play both uh, partners off against each other. They would like to have the security benefits of uh, being in America's corner and the economic benefits of being in China's corner. But the South Koreans realize now that they're gonna to have to choose because this uh, trade war between China and the United States is becoming something bigger. And uh, Biden does not look like he's going to depart radically from that. So the South Koreans, if they have to choose, and if the Americans force the South Koreans to make that choice, are likely to choose China. And that's going to have implications, I think, also for um, the relationship between the two Koreas, because of course it's in China's interests uh, to try to bring those two countries closer together. Yeah, uh, Lucas, how do you see this question or the situation? Any comment? Well, actually, uh, China is uh, on our agenda when it comes to the Korean Peninsula questions. Uh, we are uh, about to decide on an investment agreement with China from EU side. Uh, I'm among the ones uh, I've on, already conveyed the message who generally believes in uh, trade, in economic exchange, or at least in investments, uh, but on a level playing field and uh, based on rule of law regulations as we know them in Europe uh, and based on, let's say, reliability. Uh, and that's, uh, the I would call it the leverage. We... Uh, have to use as European Union uh, towards China when it comes to this investment agreement, which is both in the interest of the EU and of China, but especially also in the interest of China, of course. So if uh, such an investment agreement will be established, uh, for example, 17 plus one uh, activities of China must end. There will be no place anymore, no reason, no even less legitimacy as ever before for a 17 plus one from China side in Europe. And of course, uh, China in, in, in the European view, of course, Mr. Myers uh, shared with us a very, very interesting, let's call it US view and view from Korean Peninsula on the ground, obviously. But from a European view, China has to be more reliable when it comes to its true uh, cooperation or relation at least with North Korea uh, and we we need clarification there which is also one of the leverages we have to put on the table uh, negotiating the investment agreement with China. Mm -hmm. Yeah thank you. Now my question is are there any more questions? If uh, what is the role of the sister of uh, Kim Jong-un? The role of the sister of Kim Jong-un? Uh, Brian, this is yours, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, you know, the North Korea, as I see it, really is, is a monarchy. It's the most absolute monarchy uh, in the world, perhaps the most absolute monarchy in history. Uh, if we define monarchy uh, as a state in which the leader is able to choose his successor. So whether you're called a king or national defense council chairman, or, you know, um, what was it? Uh, the, uh, Cromwell, of course, was not a, a king, but he was a monarch. He was able to pass power on. Um, but at the same time, 
North Korea is trying to project, uh, especially towards South Korea, the impression of being a, a staid, a one party state, uh, a bit like East Germany, which at least follows its own formal procedures. And this is why I think Kim Yo Jong was quote unquote demoted uh, in that Workers' Party uh, Congress. I think that was an effort to show the South Korean people that in this uh, one party state, family ties are not as important as, as the party and uh, the party's own procedures. I believe that's deceptive. And I believe that uh, in North Korea, uh, what um, political scientists call the prerogative state is still more important than the legal state. So the real hierarchy of power in North Korea is not the same as this formal organogram of power that we are given through things like the Workers' Party Congress. And yeah. because it's a family-owned state, there's really no other way to put it, it's a family-owned state, Kim Yo-jong is naturally uh, one of the most powerful people in the country. She's certainly not as powerful as Kim Jong-un, uh, but I don't think it's possible to put her uh, anywhere down on the, um, on the hierarchical ladder uh, below the family itself. That just doesn't make sense to me. So, I think her role is going to be to uh, reinforce uh, the hawk's doves view of North Korea. This is something that the North Koreans have tried to use in negotiations with the United States uh, in Singapore and in Hanoi. Uh, Kim Jong-un likes to tell the Americans, uh, I would like to uh, make concessions, but I've got hawks uh, in my government or in the army who will not let, let me make concessions. And the Americans find this very hard to believe, just as I do, because everybody knows that it's basically a family-owned state. So I think the North Koreans have, have reached this very clever solution of making Kim Yo jung pose as the hawk, okay? But if she is seen to be equal with Kim Jong-un, then the Americans are not going to want to make a concession to him because the hawks could exploit it right away. Therefore, the hawk has to be put below Kim Jong-un in the hierarchy, but not so far below that she doesn't seem uh, dangerous at all, okay? Uh, so this is how Kim Jong-un is going to try to keep persuading the Americans that they need, need to make concessions to him so that the hawks don't get back into control. Uh, this is my understanding of what's going on. I hope I've explained that all right. Uh, how do you see, maybe just a question, how do you see, uh, I mean, which signal do you see behind uh, Kim's election as Secretary General uh, of, the, of the Workers' Party? Yeah, well, for the same reason, I don't take these things very seriously. Uh, North Korea is a state that has never taken party procedure uh, seriously. And really, it ceased to be a one-party state in 1967, uh, and it became a one-man dictatorship. Now, that does not mean, of course, that the dictator decides everything. Uh, it means that the dictator decides everything that he wants to. Uh, so I, I warn people against taking these titles too seriously and believing that this is a kind of Lenin type uh, state in, in which he really needs to persuade people of things or in which uh, the votes that take place in the Supreme People's Assembly really do have an effect on policy because it's just not that uh, kind of a state. Yeah, do we have uh, any more questions? Yeah, maybe the last one, because yeah. there is a time is short. Uh, this is again to Professor Mears. In your book, The Cleanest Race, the self understanding of North Korea about being the chosen race plays a great role. Is it similar for South Korea? And if yes, could this be a common ground for unification? Um, it is a similar belief here in, uh, in South Korea. What the South Koreans do not understand or no longer feel any kind of uh, understanding for is the North Koreans' hostility to racial intermixing, to miscegenation and things like that. South Korea is gradually, slowly becoming, uh, I think, a, a multi-ethnic society. Um, and that's a big difference. But still, at the same time, the South Koreans share the North Koreans' view of the Korean race as being a uniquely moral, a uniquely pure uh, race, which has been victimized 
by the rest of the world for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, so this, of course, gives uh, the two Koreas something that they can bond over. And there's an awful lot of nationalist talk and nationalist symbolism at these summits. Uh, and of course, when President Moon and uh, Kim Jong-un uh, went to uh, Mount Pekdu, that too was a photo op which was uh, uh, full of nationalist symbol symbolism for the South Koreans. But it would be wrong to believe that um, because they share nationalism, that they do feel some kind of really strong urge to get together. The North Koreans do want unification and they want real unification. But the South Koreans, as I said, are perfectly content to enter into symbolic unification in the form of a confederation and keep that going for decades and decades. There's really no sense of urgency about unification here in South Korea. And this is why I feel it's dangerous because you've got one side which has not just an ideological incentive to unify, but an economic uh, incentive uh, to unify. And on the other side, you've got the South Koreans who are kind of flirting with unification, flirting with nationalism in a way uh, which I think uh, could lead to dangerous misunderstandings between the two Koreas. Uh, I talk to my students and I get the impression that their attitude towards North Korea, they look at North Korea kind of like a German looks at an Austrian. You share the same language, uh, but they no longer feel any strong blood uh, bond uh, with each other here in South Korea, which is very different from North Korea, where people talk about unification all the time, talk about the need to liberate South Korea from the Yankee yoke and so on. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe Lucas, final statement? Uh, actually, I really highly appreciate the exchange with uh, Mr. Myers as an expert uh, that's uh, really of high value for my parliamentary work and the work of the whole delegation of the European Parliament with the Korean Peninsula because uh, Mr. Myers provided all of us in this uh, little more than an hour with a lot of uh, very, very important insights uh, beyond, I would say, the usual daily political talk, which we all are aware of, which is also important and has its place. but. Uh, the deep insights by uh, the expertise of Mr. Myers uh, is of crucial importance. So that's uh, again a reason to thank uh, the uh, Peace Federation uh, for this opportunity today and you, uh, Werner Fasslabend, for chairing uh, this today talk. Uh, I guess uh, European Union has to remain engaged uh, even if it's geographically remote. Uh, the uh, world, uh, let's say, needs reliable facilitators and the European Union sees itself uh, to be one, especially uh, in the field uh, of uh, taking care, uh, 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 especially for the people of the Korean Peninsula. And that's uh, uh, in the forefront uh, of our priorities. And that's what we try to keep up in European Parliament. And what we need for that are reliable sources of information like the one uh, Mr. Myers provided us with today and what we also need are reliable partners and we are each and every day seeking for reliable partners uh, to talk to each other and to find solutions for uh, the ongoing problems as well as for uh, achieving visionary goals like the one of reunification. So thank you also for pointing out in the title of today's talk especially this uh, important is issue of reunification. Take care and stay healthy, all of you. Best regards from Brussels, from my side. Thank you. So I want to renounce for any uh, summary, maybe just one very short word, you know, uh, whether it is predictable or not. Uh, we have to be aware that in history, also surprise can come as it was a surprise, not only for me, but for everybody, when in Europe, political uh, scenery changed completely. You know, the only person I knew uh, that was convinced that Germany would reunite was Otto von Habsburg, uh, son of the late emperor, the Austrian emperor, 
uh, probably due to his view uh, over, I don't know, not only decades, but centuries. Nobody else believed in it, you know. Uh, I did not expect that I could uh, experience it in my lifetime, and so uh, nobody did. And insofar, I think one of the lessons certainly is, uh, let us be careful and try to prepare, even if it is not probable. Uh, even if the nowadays situation uh, does not seem to be mature, to be ripe uh, for such a next step. And with these words, I want to give it back and thank uh, once again uh, the two speakers. It really was a, a pleasure to listen to you. And I give the word to Peter Haider. Thank you very much, Dr. Faslam. Thank you to the speakers. Uh, Magister Lukas Mandel and Professor Brian Myers. Thank you. It was really many new insights, especially about Korea. I lived one year in Korea and I didn't notice many of the things you spoke about. Uh, thank you. So at the end of our conference, uh, I want to introduce you to Mr. Jacques Marion. He is the co-chair of UPF, the Universal Peace Federation in Europe. He worked uh, many years, not in Korea, but in China. He also worked for many years in Russia, and he is born in Africa, but uh, a French citizen. Now he is in Paris since a few years. So you can see he knows the world quite well, and he will give us a few final words about perspectives of the work of the Universal Peace Federation, also in relation to our uh, Northeast Asia or Korean Unification Initiative. Jacques. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be brief. We come to the end. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, really. Uh, Dr. Fasalab and uh, Mr. Mandel, Mr. Myers, really uh, thank you for your very insightful presentations. I prepared a brief text, okay, so I'll just read it to share about this uh, peace initiative that motivated this webinar and others that we will organize in our organization UPF this year. As you heard from today from Peter Heider, uh, our founders were born both in what today is North Korea. Uh, they shared the destinies of millions of Korean people who fled the North during the Korean War, leaving relatives behind whom they could never see again. So uh, at the root, what motivates UPF, our organization's efforts towards reunification, is this longing for a reunited homeland that is still shared by many Korean people. And that's what prompted our founders to make their historical visit to Pyongyang in December 91 uh, to meet with President Kim Il-sung. At that time, our founder, Dr. Moon, was considered an enemy of Kim Il-sung because of his clear stand against worldwide communism and the Juche ideology. And he himself had experienced the harsh conditions of a North Korean prison and labor camp for three years in the late 1940s after Kim Il-sung had taken power in the north of Korea. However, that meeting with President Kim Il-sung in December 91 was very fruitful and concluded with an agreement covering points that have later been the framework for North Korean diplomatic policy, the reunification of families, the peaceful use of nuclear energy, the welcoming of investments by overseas Koreans, and the economic development of the Mount Kumgang touristic region. Dr. and Mrs. Moon acted on this agreement when in 1998, they initiated the first car factory ever to be developed in North Korea called Pyonghua Motors. Investing in the very limited market of North Korea was not a profitable venture, but the name of the cars Pyonghua, meaning peace in Korean, illustrates well our founder's philosophy, which is to bring reconciliation, you need to gain the trust of the other party. And to do this, you need to go beyond your self-interest. Thus, our founders constantly encourage people to people engagement and various humanitarian projects between North and South Korea. As a result, they did gain the trust and recognition of the North Korean leaders, 
When he died in 2012, our founder, Dr. Moon, was awarded by the North Korean government the highest honor in that country, the National Reunification Award. It is the same philosophy that prompts his wife today, this year, to initiate a worldwide initiative as we commemorate the 30 year anniversary of their meeting with Kim Il Sung, that is in 91. She has, Mrs. Moon has a standing invitation from North Korea. She wants to offer all the resources of our worldwide organization to support reconciliation on the peninsula. If the health crisis allows, we plan to convene a summit in the capitals of North or South Korea, as well as fact-finding tours in the region by journalists or other leaders. One year ago, taking the risk to hold a summit meeting just before the pandemic imposed a lockdown on the world, we invited to Seoul thousands of prominent world figures, and uh, Dr. Fasselaben was one of them, from the fields of politics, religion, academia, business, and the media. On this foundation today, we are inviting leaders from each of these fields and experts from these fields to support constructive dialogue on the peninsula by forming what we call Think Tank 2022. That is a worldwide group of experts, including heads of state, parliamentarians, religious leaders, academics, business leaders, and media experts who can contribute with their knowledge and experience to the ultimate goal of Korean reunification. The Think Tank 2022 project will be launched in a few weeks from now. And we sincerely hope, dear panelists, that you can participate in this initiative. Your discussion today and the discussions we heard in many webinars we recently held on this topic underline how challenging this project is, not least because the reunification depends in great part on the conflicting interests of powerful nations surrounding Korea, China, Russia, Japan, and the United States, all of which bear a significant responsibility for the division of the peninsula. So our focus is a two-pronged initiative to raise the confidence in the possibility and importance of progressing toward unification, particularly in the minds of the people. On one hand, in South Korea, we strive to revive the vision and desire for reunification, particularly among the young generation that may be losing this desire and vision, especially those who have not known the war. But as we know, and as we know from Mr. Meyer's very interesting book, the Koreans have a burning passion for their country and a strong sense of destiny. So I believe that when they see opportunities arise on the path towards reunification, the dormant fire can be revived even among this young generation. I have personally seen this when I lived in Beijing for about eight years at the turn of the century. I saw the sense of pride and expectation young educated people have for their country, in this case, China, once they see that their country is rising in the world. On the other hand, UPF has developed worldwide over the last 15 years with a precise purpose to foster trust and reconciliation in the post-Cold War environment of conflicting ideologies, faith, and nations. On this foundation, we want to bring a broad network of leaders and experts from east to west north to south that can contribute to dialogue and mutual understanding, including in our case between Europe and the Korean Peninsula, and of course other stakeholder nations in the region, and thus create the conditions for gradually dismantling one of the last remaining wars of the Cold War, a war that has many dimensions, and as we heard today, not the least in the minds of the people. Thank you again for this very informative discussion. Thank you for coming on our webinar and I hope we have more opportunities to invite you to our events and hopefully in Korea itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Jacques, Marion. Thank once more to all the speakers, Dr. Faslam, Professor Myers and Magister Mandel.
this concludes our conference and uh, we are looking forward to seeing you soon again in one of our next conferences still now in the virtual world but hopefully soon again in the real world have a nice evening and um, a good weekend Thank send you. those if you like yeah okay yeah. okay Okay, then thank you. Bye bye and have a good weekend. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, bye -bye. Mr. Meyer.